Hello and welcome to another special edition of Inside the Parliament. It is a continuation of our Politics with Value series where we focus on enhancing the capacity of young persons to become change agents within political parties and other spheres of influence with the overall objective of creating a democratic political system which enables equal participation of all citizens, including women, youths and persons with disabilities based on values, in addition to giving them a voice in decision-making processes. Today we'll be discussing COVID-19 and democracy, harnessing opportunities for effective citizen and youth participation. The International Democracy Day is an opportunity to review the state of democracy around the world. The United Nations International Day of Democracy is annually held on September the 15th to raise public awareness about democracy. The UN strives to achieve its goals of peace, human rights preservation and development. It believes that human rights and the rule of law are best protected in democratic societies. The unprecedented COVID-19 crisis has resulted in major social, political and legal challenges globally. As states around the world adopt emergency measures to address the crisis, it is critical that they continue to uphold the rule of law, protect and respect international standards and basic principles of legality, and the right to access justice, remedies and due process. Surging youth activism and leadership has the potential to change the world in times of a pandemic like this. Accordingly, young people are increasingly being recognized as indispensable agents for sustainable development and a source of a demographic dividend. But more opportunities are needed to support their active engagement and satisfy young people's desire to have more than just a seat at the table. To promote politics with values in Nigeria, it is pertinent to establish the value of youth participation through demonstrable leadership and constructive engagement. And this could be made possible by opportunities that will empower young people with adequate resources to participate actively in democracy and contribute to curbing the negative impact of the pandemic. The purpose of this discussion is that democracy is a state where the people have rights especially to vote for and elect their government and regulation from among themselves, rather than being controlled by a government over which they have no rights of dissent or protest. Lack of democracy can lead to lack of rights or a voice, and this impacts on human rights as set out by the United Nations. The International Day of Democracy allows us the opportunity to celebrate and appreciate our democratic society. As we reflect on our freedoms and consider Nigeria's current state, we need to take inventory of how many ways youths can participate in the collective decision making of the country and support the ideals of democracy in this era of the pandemic and beyond. Additionally, we need to identify the challenges which COVID-19 poses to youth participation and harness the opportunities presented for increased youth participation. This discussion is aimed at identifying the critical concerns posed by COVID-19 as related to citizens and youth participation, harnessing emerging innovations in democratic participation, the role of youth in leadership and governance, as well as post-COVID-19 era, empowering young people with opportunities for self-development against the backdrop of unemployment which has surged amid COVID-19 lockdown, quarantines and social and economic pressures. And joining me in the studio for this conversation are Ebere Ifendo, a lawyer and president, Women in Politics Forum. You're welcome to Inside the Parliament, the special edition, of course. Thank you. And we have Adebanke Lori, the executive director, raising new voices. Thank you very much. I hope Ryan. the voices will be very loud for the youths. Yes, it's You're will. You're welcome to the program. Thank you very much. And Honorable Karu Elisha Simon, a member of Nigeria's House of Representatives and Young Parliamentarians Forum, will be joining us online. We also have some young persons in our audience here. Of course, they will have the privilege to ask their questions as we go on in the program. I'm sure you have a lot of questions bugging your mind that you want to ask about how you can be more effective in this uh, COVID-19 and post-COVID-19 era, don't you? Sure. sure. We'll come to you. Once 
our chief discussants are done with their presentation. Stay with us. We'll take a break now. Now uh, we go over to our discussion, and like I told you, we have uh, the lawyer and uh, the president of Women in Politics uh, talking about Iberi Ifendo. Once again, let's welcome you to the program. Now we're looking at the COVID-19 era and the youths, how they can participate actively in decision-making processes at this time, how they can be change agents at a time like this and of course playing politics with value what do you have to say to them thank you very much um i'm excited that the youths are getting interested in politics and they want to participate it's um, heartwarming for me because most times you see you shy away walking into the studio and uh, seeing uh, young ladies also uh, gave me a lot of hope because initially when we talk about youth you find out that's really the young men that you know come up so as it is now the young girls are beginning to take their place in the society and that's very good for me so young ladies i welcome you and i think um you're going to do you know suddenly well showing interest in politics participating and then creating more spaces for uh, other women I um, think you should welcome the young men too. Because yeah, I will. I was they, just they about will <laughs> need, they will need their support <laughs> to make it. I, I was just about <laughs> saying that, but I'm happy also that the young men are here. Um, it's good that even though it's good that we have more w young girls than what the young men we have here, because they've actually been occupying this space. This is the first time I'm seeing you know more women come up. So yes, I appreciate you. I thank you for holding forth, but it's an opportunity to create more space for the young women to participate. In all the political parties, as I speak, uh, their youth leaders are basically men. Mm -hmm. And yet we have young ladies, you know. So what a situation where political parties will also make it, you know, like a system where you, we can have a youth leader that is a woman. It will be of a great interest, you know, to have that. So when we talk about uh, marginali marginalization as women in politics, we say that because even the young ladies don't have opportunity to participate. Now going to the COVID-19 uh, era, we are still in it. We've not uh, really escaped COVID-19, even though most people in Nigeria think it's over, it's not yet over. Uh, the youth definitely will have a great role to play, considering even the nature of the pandemic. They tell us that uh, people above 60 should keep away. So automatically, it has even created an opportunity for the youth <laughs> to participate. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> um, since the older ones are encouraged to stay at home, older ones are encouraged to keep away because most of them are people with underlying ailments. So you see that as an opportunity for the youth to participate. So but how can they do it? If we don't create that opportunity for them as a government, you know, to create uh, opportunities where the young people will be utilized the way we are looking at today. Now, um, restiveness is what we usually identify with the youth. But these days I have seen, you know, in different forums where you come up with uh, things in, that are very interesting to the community. Some of them come, uh, came up uh, really with ideas on how to, you know, protect people. They were part of the people we used actually, you know, to reach out to the um, communities. They, they, they were the people who also helped with uh, even uh, distribution of palliatives. So um, I think um, we are doing well, but as a nation, and then uh, in a few days time, we are going to be 60 years. Have we really done well as a nation, you know, with what we do with our youth? I have say no, because um, if, if you go to the parliament, the average age of uh, members of parliament there will tell you that uh, they are more of older people, you know. So who represents the youth? Who will, you know, bring up issues concerning them? I'm also aware that they're not too young to run was a project that uh, helped some people to come up. But what's the percentage? Just like we talk about the minimal percentage of women participating in politics. We also have, you know, I think they are, theirs is even worse than ours, you know. So uh, it's a situation that um, government will take deliberate efforts to see that uh, we occupy them in a more useful way. Um, we give them uh, leadership roles to play. Um, Using uh, this COVID-19, again, I'm going to say that um, apart from distribution of palliatives, can we have them, you know, talk more, come up 
um, give them assignments on what next do they think you know they can do to support the country. You know, so for me, we have not created enough opportunities for them. That I must say, I'm part of it. I'm being an older person in politics, so I'm not exonerating myself. But uh, I'm looking at generally like um, the people holding more powers that can take decisions that will affect us, like the parliament, like the executive within the states and even the federal government. Uh, the youths are ready and uh, they are calling on us to do something to support them. So I think. Um, this era is an era that has really opened our eyes to see that we need to work with them more. Thank so you. let's hear from uh, Adebanke Ilori, the executive director, raising new voices. Uh, Banke, yes. how do you think the youth can be more effective in this era that we are? Okay. Um, to add to what Barry Steifendo has said, um, I also think that young people have contributed to this process with respect to being um, the health responders as far as COVID-19 is concerned. So you see a lot of people who work with the NCDC, for example, um, the doctors, the nurses, we've, we've had to work with more young people because of the, the age challenge that comes with the pandemic. Young people can also take um, greater responsibilities by supporting the existing structures of government. So the government has put in place a team to monitor the the the, the results that Nigeria has achieved with respect to COVID-19 and young people can monitor that process as well. With respect to transparency and accountability with um, regards to um, the donations that have been made, I'm aware that young people have taken some steps in that regard. A number of civil society organizations that are pushing for um, transparency in that regard are driven by young people. So what I think we can do is for more young people to get involved in that process of ensuring transparency and accountability. Also, one of the things we've observed with respect to the COVID-19 pandemic is that the government has had to take on emergency powers, um, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but it would mean that there, there's a need for citizen-oriented um, monitoring of the process. So we need to ensure that um, state actors like the police, um, um, are, are monitored by young people so that rights of the citizens are not trampled upon. Also, with respect to responses to marginalized persons, um, instances of sexual and gender-based violence, we need to engage the authorities so that we don't see people lose their rights, you know, while we're trying to ensure that um, the pandemic doesn't spread, so that responses to um, em emerging and urgent issues are um, the continue to be proactive so that we don't see a situation whereby we, we suffer more loss because we're trying to prevent the pandemic from spreading. Now, Dr. Elendu, you said something earlier about, uh, you know, getting the uh, 60s to stay at home and uh, thereby paving the way for the young ones to uh, take charge of most of the things happening. But has it also occurred to you that in spite of the fact that the older ones have been asked to stay away, when it comes to decision making, they are still making decisions for the whole country in their bedrooms and in their study rooms. And that the young ones are not in the decision making category. Um, meanwhile, most of what is happening affects the youths and the younger ones more. Yeah, exactly what I said. I said like in the parliament, you know, that's where most decisions are made between the parliament and the executive. You can hardly find, you know, the younger no, people you, there. You know, we're narrowing it to this COVID-19 yes, era. I, I know what That's I'm why saying. I had to come up with this. Yeah. Is it, it, how do you suddenly get the youth to get to that level where they'll be part of the decision-making process? That's the challenge right now. Um, it's just to open the political process more, you know, to accommodate them. Because um, we are expecting to have another election in 2023. Mm -hmm. So we need the youth to participate in that election to come up and then for parties to you know have them as candidates um it's not easy for me now to say that um what, what can we do are we going to throw away the ones that are already in parliament we have to wait for the new uh, session to come up and so the youth will participate so what majorly we should be looking at now is how can the political process be more you know expanded and open to accommodate younger ones. What's our percentage? I mean, the younger ones, what's their percentage in governance? It is very low, like I said. 
And it is important that in decision making, I mean, unless we are going to be talking about setting up of ad hoc committees mm -hmm. that will take care of uh, COVID uh, you know, response and the rest, in that situation, knowing that, in fact, they, I think the leaders will be even ready to step aside when it comes to that because they want to live, they don't want mm -hmm. to die. So the youth should uh, honestly take charge of that and then use that as a stepping stone to say, look, we did so well you know, during this COVID uh, response uh, time. And it's an opportunity to, you know, for us to be given an opportunity to do more for the nation. It's very um, disheartening because um, they take decisions, like you said. They talk about issues they may not understand because at the time they were youth, we had different things. They didn't have uh, internet, they didn't have computers and the rest. And so they are living in that age. Bringing up their ideas of yesteryears will not be able to work at this present time. So it's... Uh, also for the youth to make themselves available, make themselves available is very important. I like what she said, you know, that um, even the response and then uh, for accountability and the rest that the youth were, came up, you know, to be part of it. So it's important that in decision making, you know, we create a, a, a deliberate opportunity for them to lead as they are leading in this COVID uh, response uh, team. Um, majorly, uh, like I said earlier, it's going to be a stepping stone and uh, during the next elections, we are going to use their achievements this time to begin to seek for more opportunities, political opportunities come 2023. So, uh, Adubanke, yes, yes um, a, a, with regard to elective offices, we may not be able to get the youths in. Of course, they tried the last time, but uh, uh, it didn't quite favor most of them that uh, came out. But what about advisory positions? What about as a... Uh, SAs, senior special assistants. When do you think the youth needs to, the youths need to agitate to get into such positions? That way they can also advise the older ones who are there. Absolutely. I agree with you um, with respect to that point. I also think that one thing that um, I am aware that young people have been doing is um, clamoring for electoral reforms. So at Raising New Voices, for example, we, we are part of a coalition that is youth di driven, you know, monitoring the process um, for pushing for electoral reforms. And one of the recommendations that we have made is that young people be integrated in the process. So political parties be mandated to promote um, um, the, 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 the fielding of candidates who are young people. Also, we respect our appointive positions. Um, like you have said, we need to integrate more young people in that space. So if we have a legal framework, because it's easy for us to just um, agitate for these things, they are important things. But if we do not have a legal framework to protect those rights, implementation might be a challenge. So that's one of the things that um, I think we can do with respect to supporting young people. So putting these structures in place, legal framework that has to be followed. So if there is a political party that doesn't follow that um, legal framework, for example, young people can go to court and say, oh, OK, this person or this political party did not follow this process. Or um, for, for, for this board, for example, there's supposed to be two seats for young people. but this board hasn't met that requirement. These are things that I believe would also ensure that young people begin to um, get into this space. But definitely, young people also need to learn, like Barry Steifinder has said. So the opportunities to be um, special advisors, commissioners, are important um, rules for them to also learn. So we should push to also get involved in that space. All right, the program is Inside the Parliament on Africa Independent Television, and this is a special edition of our series on politics with value, of course, with the youths uh, 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 wanting to come up so that they can contribute their quota to nation uh, building and to revamping uh, most of the things that have uh, gone wrong in our society. Now, Honorable Karu Elisha Simon, a member of Nigeria's House of Representatives, is online now and uh, will be uh, joining him. Honorable uh, Simon, uh, welcome to Inside the Parliament. Thank you very much. And I profusely apologize for uh, linking up with you very late. I, it was unavailable, but um, I appreciate that uh, it is better late than never. Thank you very much. Well, that, that, that's all right. <laughs> at least you'll be giving us your own uh, contribution. Now we're looking at the place of youth in this COVID-19 and post COVID-19 era, uh, being able to harness the potentials of the youths, bringing them to play politics of value and contributing to uh, national development. What would you have 
to say to them? Yeah, well, thank you very much for the invitation to be on such a platform. And uh, I sincerely appreciate that um, I'm one of the identified young persons to speak on this issue. Uh, first, I would like to uh, speak a bit on uh, what I had in the uh, little conversation you had with two of my other colleagues on this platform, where uh, they spoke about uh, elective offices and um, uh, being skeptical about uh, the possibilities for young people to clinch such offices in the 2023 election. I am saying with confidence and with affirmation that uh, elective offices for young people in 2023 is very possible. And I'm confident that we will see an upsurge from the 2019 election. Uh, I don't see a possibility where people who control more than 50% of the voting population, uh, 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 how do I put it, uh, uh, relenting of, of taking comfort in accepting only political appointments as ACs and so on. I think uh, we need to inspire more young people to understand that uh, the voting pattern and the strength of voting in Nigeria lies amongst the young people. And if only we can harness our energy together and forward and champion a particular cause in, in terms of election, it is very possible. It was possible in my own time, and I'm confident that the young and inspiring young people that are coming after me will do much better than what I am doing. So I want to put the narrative straight that elective uh, offices for young people in Nigeria in 2023 is very, very possible. So I want to go to talk about uh, the COVID-19 era. While um, COVID-19 came and uh, looked like a cost to so many people, uh, I'm beginning to see that uh, COVID-19 is the greatest blessing that has ever happened to planet Earth. And the most uh, uh, blessed uh, uh, category of persons are the people in Africa. And Nigeria, as the biggest country in Africa, should take the largest portion of the blessing that has come through the COVID-19. Uh, first, I would like to look at the health sector. It has exposed to everybody the inadequacies in our health sector and the need for the Nigerian government to invest further in the health sector. It, it cuts across from our primary health care uh, centers to our specialist hospital to our research in terms of health. And there are quite a lot of people who never knew the existence or what even NCDC means. But COVID-19 has brought them to limelight and has even challenged the legislature to review the existing uh, laws that governs the, the operations and establishment of NCDC. So I think it is up to Nigerians to consider it a blessing and see the other component of it by calling the legislators and the government today and demanding for accountability from our government. There is no better blessing than COVID-19 to the health sector. And I think you made mention of um, uh, the, the, the impact and uh, well, how young people can actually thrive in, in, in COVID-19. Like I said earlier, the greatest blessing that uh, the world has witnessed is COVID-19. And it is the biggest opportunity for young people. There is no category of persons in Nigeria that have the capacity to do online activities and to surf the internet as the young people. So what it means is that it has shifted and given young people the opportunity to showcase themselves. It's a wide opportunity for young, young people to get involved. Everything has gone online. Meetings have gone online. Trainings have gone online. And then it has crashed the cost of very expensive trainings that people have to travel abroad to go and participate. You, you, you will see trainings that are worth 10,000 US dollars, 15,000 US dollars being crashed to as low as three, four, five thousand 5,000 era because all other costs has been cut off. So there is no better time to seize the opportunity and improve ourselves and prepare much more for the developments that COVID-19 is ready to unveil in the post-COVID era. Thank you. You, you, you. Let me just quickly take you up on something before I ask the other questions. You talked about some things being cheaper. And that, how many people will agree with that? Yeah. The, the, because the, the rate the, of inflation the, has the, increased. The rate of, yes, the rate of training has crashed. People who would have to pay flight tickets, pay accommodation, and travel abroad okay. to participate in specific trainings are given the opportunity to participate online. Mm -hmm. Some of these trainings are even given free rather than being paid for. So I still repeat that the cost of training has crashed, regardless of the value, the, 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 the Naira value, which is temporary. I don't believe that uh, the current Naira value is what it is. Nigerians have not realized what we have. 
And that's the reason why we still feel that the dollar is stronger than the naira. I am confident that in no distant time, Nigeria will compete favorably in terms of the foreign exchange. All right. Now, let's uh, look at uh, the contribution in decision-making process. I think that's one of the key things that uh, the youths need at this point in time. Because if you don't have a say in where decisions about you are being made, uh, you're just uh, like an errand boy who just carries out uh, whatever has been uh, decided. You talk about decision making in this era. How can the youths get in? People like you who are in positions of leadership, what spaces are you creating for the youths to come in and be part of the decision making process? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll be a little apologetic to other young people who, whom I may sound a bit arrogant to, to them. I, I sincerely apologize. But I think I want to take on the youth. Nobody will give you power. You must rise and take it. Nobody gave me this office. There is no single politician in Nigeria that can confidently come out to the public and tell you that they gave me the office. From the primaries to the general election, I walked through it. And even before the time of election, I had to build myself. Right from primary school, I was interested in leadership. I went to secondary school and I began to pick interests in politics. I began to prepare myself for such an office. And it was in 1997 that I picked up the courage that I was going to get involved in partisan politics. But I realized that I had a lot of gaps and I needed to understand the environment. I took up vacation in civil society activities to build myself, to prepare myself for such a time. In 2011, I wanted to vie for a councillor in my ward. My daddy stepped me down. In 2015, my friends called me that we should attend to the State House of Assembly. And I told them that I was studying, and it was also instrumental to prepare me for politics subsequently. So I declined. In 2019, nobody invited me to run for office. I stepped out to say I was going to run for office. And when I dared the office of the, National, of the House of Reps, a lot of people felt it was a wrong move. But I stood out and insisted that it was time for me to run for such an office, that it was actually time that we begin to, we begin to uh, get involved in, we begin to get involved in the politics of the country. We, I, I didn't, I was never at any point feeling discouraged that that office was not possible. So I feel we need to look at young people. How many of the young people are willing to make the sacrifice? How many young people are willing to dare any office in this country? When it is time, I'll dare the highest office in this country. But it is not yet time. So I feel that young people have to create the spaces. Just as young people have created the spaces of online robbery, online uh, all forms of foreign and activities and so on. Did anybody teach them? Did anybody give them the space? They created those sort of spaces for themselves. So what I think about Niger Nigerian young people is that we need to flip our energy. If we have the capacity to make millions online, we have the capacity to champion our cost in the entertainment industry, it is possible in the political environment. So I think young people need to begin to chart that course. It is possible. I am saying it is possible because I started from nowhere and I emerged to this office. So this is enough a story to challenge any young person in Nigeria that young people are capable and young people have the spaces. They only need to step into such a space to actualize uh, what, what we desire in the political environment. Okay. Uh, we honestly believe that the youths have learned a lot from what you have just shared, but it is also pertinent to note that people like you who, ha who are already there can help give a push to some of these uh, young ones. That is one. Then secondly, a lot of youths who aspired in the last elections uh, lost out because uh, some people did not have uh, confidence in them. You look at some of the youths in office in positions of governance, like some of the very young governors, people will tell you, oh, these people have not impressed us in spite of the fact that uh, they are young people. We are not impressed by most of their activities. Is there any way this narrative can be changed to favor I, the I, youths? I wouldn't, want, I wouldn't want to make references and um, I wouldn't want to be seen as pointing fingers at, at um, or the younger people. Probably is a learning curve for them. It's a learning experience. And uh, that could be an opportunity for them to listen to the people and understand where such errors are being made. 
everybody has a perspective. And I want to believe that those young people whom you feel have not fared well are only, uh, 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 how do I put it, ruling out their own narratives, what they understand from the perspective of leadership. And uh, uh, it is good for Nigerians to compare based on what we believe is expected. Uh, uh, there are accidental leaders, and there are those leaders who are being exposed. I don't want to take anybody to any category, but young people must dare to rise. That is the reason why I discourage any young people who is looking up to another person to raise him. We must dis define our own purpose. We must define our own, our own, uh, and cover our own niche in the political environment. So I wouldn't want to say ill of anybody based on your questions, uh, whether or not uh, young people have been firing well or that. I feel that they are on their learning curve and uh, it, other young people should learn from them and differ from their own approach to politics. And what about the aspects of uh, helping to give them a push to make it easier? Well, Especially well, with, <laughs> when you talk about resources, you know that the policy yeah. is so monetized. Yeah, but, but, but I like the question you just threw at me. Part of the reasons why I'm late is because um, I was kidnapped into a program and I said I was not going to be part of the program because I needed to hear. Uh, but uh, two strong young people whom uh, we've been together quickly ran to me and insisted I must be there, regardless of uh, my push that I was going to be here. And all they wanted was for me to contribute in the events. And there, after making an, uh, an, insp an, an inspired uh, pr presentation, I concluded by scolding one of the youths, whom I personally sponsored to attend a CMD training, Center for Management Development, paid 250000 to five of them. One is not even my constituent. And I told them, every one of them, that for the period of time of the training in Abu Dhabi, pay for your accommodation, feeding, and transport. I'll pay for your training. I wanted to see the level of commitment young people have. One of them declined. That if accommodation, transport, and feeding will not be given, the person will not participate. So I think it's a two-way thing. I am always ready, but I cannot support young people and give them everything. Oh, yeah. Because they also need to make sacrifice. It is out of sacrifice that you feel the pain of learning the true values and principles of politics. And we do not want to continue to give everything at the disposal of a young person. We spoil the child. Let the young child understand how to actually make personal sacrifices and make commitments to also write. I am open. And in fact, Part of the, uh, my, my this week uh, uh, demands that we made from uh, young parliamentarians, we demanded for an increase of about 20 billion towards young people in the health sector and in the uh, ministries of youth and women and so on. And all the areas we actually identified are key areas that touch the lives of young people. So for me personally, I am very open to support young people anywhere, regardless of region, whether you're from my constituency or not. Because I believe an empowered young person in Lagos is an empowered society for the entire country, regardless of where he might be from. Right. Uh, let me ask you, aside from you doing this on your own, are there also fora where you get uh, young leaders like you to come together to brainstorm on how to bring up uh, more younger persons into positions of leadership? I think um, it is not unfortunate. But uh, I was reviewing the leadership antecedents of this country and uh, what our past leaders have done in terms of political development for this country. And I realized that the Nigerian army or the military as a whole have been quite strategic in developing leaders, but closed to the military, not open to everyone. It is only in the military that you find strategic leadership uh, centers established by government funds, right from the junior officer's cadre up to the highest rank of the generals. They have various institutes for training and preparing leaders. How many of such do we actually have in this country? If we must solve youth issues in this country, we must establish youth leadership development centers. It is necessary. We need to prepare young people for the challenges ahead. We don't, have always, we don't always have to imagine that young people need empowerment in terms of stipends or in terms of other, other supports like uh, motorcycles, this and that to go and do. Let me ask you one question that we asked uh, Honorable Obanikoro last, uh, in the last edition. 
this issue of resources, because there is no politics and no politicking in this country without resources because of the high monetized nature of the Nigerian polity and Nigerian politics. How did you get through it? Well, um, I don't believe that there are no resources in this country. I want to touch a little aspect of that before I continue. How do they it, access those resources? That's yeah, that's fine. Um, let's look at the agencies in this. We have over 300 agencies and commissions in Nigeria. We need to begin to check them and see what they are doing with their resources. This is part of the objective that the Young Parliamentarians Forum have picked to actually begin to check and ensure as legislators we have a responsibility to, to oversight. And as young parliamentarians, we'll begin to push for that. There are a lot of funds that have been voted for quite a number of activities in this country. But because the, there is no citizen demand for accountability towards that, people get away with it. And coming back to how did I get to get to about this, I prepared myself. I began to give the little that I had in community engagement activities. And I was focused to build my capacity and prepare myself. What do I need as a, as, as, as a legislator? Or what do I need as a politician? the ability to analyze issues and to convey them articulately. And that was the number one priority I took. Politics is not about money. It is about your individual and about the network that you're able to establish. I didn't have to do any form of business to generate money for my, for, for my activities. But I did various forms of business activities to impact the lives of other young people across the country. And when it was time to run for office, my own senior in secondary school, whom I had not met for 24 years, the day we first met, offered to pay for my tickets because he had followed my track record of activities. Whatever we are doing as young people, somebody is actually watching us. As I speak to you in the next 30 minutes, I'll be joining an online conversation with some international experts in the US. How did it come about? They followed most of the interviews I have been doing recently and gave me an invitation to do that. So a lot of times we seem to be doing things, we should do them for the values and for the principles we actually stand for. They, those opportunities will come to us. So we shouldn't, Talk about resources when we have not built our capacity. Some teachers say, when the student is ready, the teacher is there. Let the youth prepare themselves and be ready. Oh, thank you so, so much. Uh, Honorable Karelaita Simon, a member of Nigeria's House of Representatives. I'm sure the youths have gained quite a lot from you on this edition of the program. Thank you. And we do hope we have you again at another uh, time. Thank you so thank much. You. I appreciate it. And I still apologize for being late. <laughs> That's all right. I'm sure they don't mind. Uh, the program is Inside the Parliament on African Independent Television, a special edition looking at politics with value. And of course, the role of youths uh, uh, in this uh, COVID-19 and post-COVID-19 era, uh, harnessing the great potentials of uh, citizens and youth for participation in all spheres of governance and particularly decision making process now we have uh, in the studio you've met uh, yes uh, uh, mrs elendo lawyer and of course i uh, met at the bank lori they have addressed us earlier we'll now go over to the youths who are in this uh, uh, auditorium with us so it's time to take your questions uh, who we have the first shot i'm sure the lawyer and the uh, banker are quite uh, ready to take on your questions. All right. Okay. I'll, I'll Who go has first. the first shot? Introduce okay. yourself. Okay. Uh, my name is Chief Sin Mew. Um, mm? Chief Sin Mew. Okay. I'm the volunteer with WFD and uh, a member of uh, Politics with Value Project. My question is actually concerning when you mentioned about building a legal framework for young people in the uh, political setting now for them to be able to get the position of uh, XAs and other regs. I want to ask, uh, in the electoral reform, is there a provision in the reform where political parties can actually give this some slots, sort of, to young people in the internal party system? Because I think the whole problem we're facing as a country is from the political party angle, where youth are derogated from not participating properly in electoral matters. So it's a provision in the Electoral Act where youth actually giving some kind of slots for there should be amendment for these young people to be given such positions. Okay, and um, thank you for your question. 
Yes, the current Electoral um, Amendment Act has made provisions um, stating that political parties should ensure um, diversity and inclusion with respect to the candidates that they field. But the challenge we have identified is that it didn't set aside a certain percentage. So it didn't say anything like 20% or 15%. And it has, it's part of the recommendations we have submitted to the National Assembly, which will continue to engage them. On. There has to be, you know, when you make statements like that, um, the possibility of enforcement is, is very lax. So what we want to see is for them to say 20% or 25% or a certain, you know, something that is fixed. The same way women have been able to, although we haven't really gotten a lot of results, <laughs> yeah. you know, we have been able to, you know, talk about the provisions of the national gender policy, which provides for 35%. Mm -hmm. And it's something that we can work with. Unfortunately, um, Madam Iberi <laughs> would, agree, would agree with me that it's been difficult to to um, impose, to ensure that that law is complied with. So what we want to see now is for um, the Electoral Act to say, okay, 35%, minimum of 35% for women, 20% for men, uh, sorry, 20% for, for youth, then persons with disability as well. I know the Disability Act makes provisions, you know, strict, um, stated, clearly stated portions of the law that people can say by virtue of section so and so, this party um, has faulted itself with respect to compliance to the law. Yeah. Okay, lastly, if <laughs> 35 affirmation is given a challenge, we can achieve that up to now. Do you think for young people and people with disability that will go? Oh well, yes. Um, I, I think that what we need to do is to not say, "Oh, we don't, we don't have to try because we haven't been able to. Okay. We have not yet achieved success." What we need to do is continue to engage and continue to open up the space. And the way we can open up the space is to make these kind of certain provisions. So a lot of people have said, "Oh, affirmative action, you know, let people fight and all of that." But we must identify the fact that this is a problem, you know. Marginalizations of young people, of young men and persons with disability is a problem. And to address it, affirmative action is a tested and trusted way to ensure that we get some changes in that regard. And uh, if you listen to what <laughs> Honorable Karu said, he talked about persistence and the fact that nobody yes. gives you, you Thank have you. to uh, take it. So, through. next question who's taking the next question? Okay. Uh, no, one of the, uh, I think a lady should now, okay. <laughs> Okay, Introduce yourself um, and take your question. All right, my name is Jane Adindu. I yes. volunteer with Westminster Foundation of Democracy. Um, my question is to her. Yeah. To the lawyer. To the lawyer, yes. By the way, we are both lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. okay. okay yeah. my question is to Barista Iberi. Um, talking about um, women involvement in politics, we know it's not just, uh, involvement in politics is not just in the elective positions. Right. Even going as far as um, exercising your franchises and involvement in mm -hmm. politics, but I'm concerned about elective positions. What are the practical steps you would advise young women to take, those that have interest in running for elective positions? Emphasis on practical, what could work I think the first thing for a young woman who is interested in politics to do is to join a political party. You can't run for an elective office unless you're sponsored by you know, a platform. So you need a political party to sponsor your candidacy. So first thing you do is to join a political party of your choice, and that's what I preach. Um, look at uh, their manifestos and the constitution of, I mean, right now we have about 18 political parties. So it's making it easier for you to be able to go through all that. So you look for a party that speaks to your interest and where you think you can, you know, make an impact if you join. And then when you join the party, it's important for you not just to be a card carry member, to be a financially committed um, I mean, a financial committed member of the party. What do I mean by that? By paying your dues. And in most political parties, you find out that the dues are so minimal, some 200 naira a month, some 500 naira a month. So it's not like an outrageous uh, amount that you cannot you know, pay. So because when you're not um, uh, a financially committed member of the party, you're not going to be able to participate even as um, a delegate. Because if it's for... Uh, party members, they look at those ones that have paid their dues. So you also create an opportunity to participate in party activities. What can you do? Like you're volunteering now with uh, WFD, 
you can also volunteer in your political party. They have events and you say, oh, chairman, I can do this. Woman leader, I can do that. You know, you come on board. You can come to a political party and be the one to teach them the use of ICT. You have made yourself relevant. So, so if there's anything coming up, they are looking for you. Okay. And so when you come up to ask for, you know, the ticket to run for an election, they already know you and already have seen what you can offer. And then you will see, most people won't be able to challenge it. I'm giving you this experience because uh, I'll say, it, uh, basically it was just my story that I'm relating now to you. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, starting as a national woman leader of a political party, I rose to become the first woman to be elected as the publicity secretary of a political party, of a major political party. So I didn't just achieve that, you know, by just being a woman. Mm -hmm. But I achieved that by showing capacity, showing interest, and being, you know, um, part of party activities. And so when it was an opportunity for me, you know, to come on board, yes, other people had the interest, but the party already have seen my work. So it was so easy for me to garner support from the delegates of the party. So it's important for every young woman who's interested in politics to get registered. So you don't wait to the last minute. And then you want to just do a beautiful poster and then take the poster will take you, you know, up there. Mm -hmm. So register, participate, and I think uh, we'll get there. Thank and you. And if you remember, Honorable Simon talked about getting involved in uh, community work, yeah. maybe mm -hmm. some CSOs, NGOs, so you learn uh, the, 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 the basic things about uh, leadership uh, and governance before you launch in. All right, we'd like to acknowledge that we have some persons who have been with us Online, uh, we have Masood Male, we have Olufemi Olalekon, we have Eunice Enoch, uh, we have uh, uh, Stephen Oguntoyibo, Gloria Emmanuel, and uh, Ulumide Shobande, Uwara Ekanem, and Kohol Yonav. Uh, they have uh, uh, been with us and they are still with us. Uh, we also have Emmanuel Tadavus, uh, they have uh, been with us online and uh, once they have a contribution or question, we will give them the opportunity to do so. So who is coming up with our next question? Okay, introduce yourself. And after you, the lady will take her question. So come up with your questions, please. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity. I want to thank WFD. I'm also a volunteer with the organization. My name is um, Yosue Paul Ondana. Um, my question borders on, on two things. One is the issue of m mentorship, and second is the issue of, uh, of um, uh, funding. Uh, most youth, most Nigerian youth, are becoming to be much more interested in politics. But the issue of funding has been a bane for a, a, a lot of years now. Uh, if you look at the just concluded Edo election, so you find that one young man okay participated in the election a mr uh, the, the big wit who had money and influence and several other things in your opinion what do you think is very practical in uh, making you two are interested in politics to assess funding so that they can actually um, involve in politics and then the issue of mentorship most of them who want to come from a background where like the honorable riley said uh, someone will mentor them tell them what they need to do the step that they need, should, they, they need to follow. And, and just like you, 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 you said earlier on, I would like to have your concern, your view on the issue of mentorship and funding, because it is very critical. I, I, I thought the Honorable yeah. answered that <laughs> question of funding. Mm. Uh, all right, well, maybe you add to should it. Should I add? Yes, okay. please. Okay. Sure. Um, I'm glad that you mentioned those two issues. My, my story is also similar to um, Barry Stephen, the story. I, I started participating in politics from a very early age, and I joined Koba Party in 2015. Yeah. I eventually became the acting national Publicity secretary. Yeah. Um, and speaking of mentorship, it was when I started to participate in the party that Professor Remishonaya, you know, took me up, so to say, and started providing guidance, you know, respect to my political journey. So you need to take that step. And with respect to funding in 2019 elections, we raising new voices actually started a crowdfunding platform for young people um honorable elisha was one of the people that we listed on that platform just because we figured that young people need to put their money you know where their mouth is and what we did was that we listed you know the qualifications of candidates what they had done before so you could just see that person and say okay i like what this person has done 
and you can donate to that person's campaign. So I think that that's one thing young people can explore. Apart from that, um, Honorable Lasha also mentioned um, you building social capital. I think that if I decide to run today, when I decide to run, there are some people that will call and say, see, see what I've done oh, all these years, you know, come and support me. And it's when you have built that social capital that people will be able to say, I know this person from WFD. I know this person from, you know, when he was volunteering or when she was volunteering. I know this person from when she joined the party five years ago. And I can donate to the person's campaign. Also, we also need to engage the structures. You know, I've, I've spoken about that before. So the current Electoral Amendments Act has made provisions for how much parties can charge. So you can't, for each um, office, the price has been pegged. Whatever levies, fees, contributions you want to collect from a candidate cannot be more than a certain amount. So I think that if that law is passed, that would also, you know, reduce that funding. We also need to come together, you know, as young people to support um, one another. Yeah. I have a friend who contested, you know, in a rural community in Ocean State. And one of the things we did was that we organized a lot of activities for young people in that community. So with 5,000 naira, for example, you can organize a football viewing center, you know, for people in your community. To, to At least that, give to the you know, community yes, for the community you know, to give back Just to you. engage the other young people. So it, it might not necessarily mean that you would win in the next elections, but we just need to be consistent and to keep at it. That's I think uh, Honorable Simon said as uh, much as uh, that. I don't know if, uh, Honorable Simon, you're still uh, with us. Can you just tip it something as we, we, we round up this uh, uh, program? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, that, that's fine. I just want to give um, my friend a formula. Um, yes, I agree. I, I, I don't want to be too, uh, too optimistic for other young people. We all have our different uh, makeups. We are all wired differently. Um, I just want to give uh, uh, just a formula for funding. Funding is not about Naira and Kobo. Uh, my, my, my friend uh, mentioned uh, social capital. Uh, I'm going to talk about just two things political identity and network. And the first, you have to do for yourself. The second, you may not have to struggle. You will attract them. So young people, if you want funding, build your own identity. You must be known for something. You must have a political ideology. You must be known for your principles and values. And that's the reason why I'm impressed with this uh, platform, talking about politics with values. So what is most important to attract funding is your own principles. And the second, in terms of network, you begin to attract them unnaturally. I have come across people I didn't know. I've received calls I never expected from certain people. And I'm still going to get more calls after today. Thank you and so much. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Honorable uh, Simon. I'm sure uh, you now know what to do with regard to funding. You've garnered enough from this edition and the uh, last uh, edition. Well, I would like to thank uh, our youths uh, in the studio. Uh, thanks for coming on this edition of Inside the Parliament, the special edition of our series, Politics with Value. Uh, we hope to have you uh, some other time in the subsequent editions. My sister, who couldn't get to ask her question, we are sure you'll be able to ask in the next one. And of course, let us uh, thank uh, Banke Ilori for coming on the program and for thank giving us so much me. insight, of course. Uh, uh, Mrs. Enlendo, uh, the president of Women in Politics. Thanks for coming on the program. Well, this is what we draw the curtain today on the special edition of Inside the Parliament. Uh, of course, with youths looking at COVID-19, the COVID-19 era, and uh, beyond, the, if, how to make the youths effective, uh, even at this point in time, how to get them into decision-making processes, and of course, how to harness the enormous potentials of these young ones to better the lot of the country. My name is Uju Ej. Don't forget to join us in our next uh, special one, of course, uh, of course, on the program too next Wednesday at 3.30. My name is Uju AJ. Thank you so, so much. And please stay with us.